Kukhtum Kalat and Snukonoko, Kelskan Kis Ukhan Milch, Slatim, Slatim Hitchkuz Koznan, Jerry. Wilkin can shoot and Kulkas Ulus, a drown at Mishai Chitwacht Ukhan Milch. What about two e, Jacu to me, was good Umnites, was good Taunites, good sweat. Uh, I was using uh, the Shkatim uh, language there. It's the language of the Lilwet people. That's Jerry Ullman's language. I, I want to recognize him. I, um, it's the language that I worked on for uh, many years. And what I did was the traditional, uh, we are here on the um, land of the, uh, of the Musqueam people, the Chitwaucht in Shkatim. Uh, in, uh, that means the people who have the houses, um, because in the interior we have Shishkin, uh pet houses. Here we have long houses. So that's uh, uh, Larry. That's for you. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm a linguist, um, and we linguists uh, in the indigenous world we're the kind of grease monkeys of uh, of work on um, on it with indigenous people. In that we do the, mecha the uh, mechanics of language, and very often when I'm trying to explain what we do, I explain that we. Uh, try and fix the machine, we do not drive them. Um, so it is the indigenous communities that uh, I work with and my colleagues work with that decide what, what happens to their languages. And what ha what's happening to their languages right now is not good. Um, we are losing all 26 uh, BC indigenous languages uh, that have been uh, spoken uh, traditionally in BC, which is half the number spoken in Canada. And we are in a uh, last ditch um, struggle to make sure that we document as much as we can of those languages before they turn into what is euphemistically known as heritage languages. That is languages, or sometimes sleeping languages, uh, that is languages with no remaining first language speakers. Uh, this is a real struggle. Um, any kind of uh, um, uh, uh, attempt to hide it as a, um, or to uh, make it less tragic than it seems, I think is a mistake. And um, uh, It's something that we have been looking for resources um, for a long time to help us with, but as you probably know, um, the total amount of resources that goes into uh, work on indigenous languages um, is some tiny proportion of the amount of resources that go into, for example, French immersion programs in BC. French is not in any danger of extinction at this point. Um, so um, we have a rather kind of unique perspective on indigeneity and, um, and uh, the politics of dealing with, um, with uh, of the politics of, of uh, the relationship between non-indigenous scholars and indigenous scholars and, and, and indigenous people. In some ways, it's very straightforward. By the way, please do interrupt or, um, or ask questions in the middle. I don't want to just blab, right? <laughs> so um, uh, it's a very straightforward relationship. We are both working on the same issue from very different perspectives. Um, the same issue is simply this. Um, the more we know about First Nations languages, the more um, we uh, can preserve of the, of the knowledge of the elders that we work with, the more future generations will have to work with, the closer in touch they will be with their own past, their own roots, and um, their own long, long history here. And um, from a linguist point of view, um, we're also, of course, interested in language diversity, not from an indigenous perspective, but from the perspective of, of academic linguistics. And I want to, uh, I want to emphasize that there is um, a, an intersection between the goals of linguists and the goals of indigenous uh, language activists, but we do not have exactly the same goals. And it is important to acknowledge that um, because uh, as linguists, we're interested in what's universal about language. And as um, um, indigenous um, language activists, um, uh, most of the language educators, are, uh, educators I work with are interested in what is unique to their particular language. Both perspectives are very important and both lead to essentially the same goal, which is to work as hard as we can to document the languages we're working on. And I think that is an interesting and respectful relationship between um, academics working in the university and indigenous people working in communities. We are not doing the same thing. We have shared goals. Uh, we end up working on the same projects. It's very important. 
Okay, what I want to do now is, um, uh, because I like to be a bit of an agent provocateur in these situations, as some of you will know, um, is to talk about some of the pitfalls of, uh, indigenous, uh, of work on indigenous languages by non-indigenous scholars. And some of them you will recognize um, straight away. Some of them are uncontroversial, some are less controversial. I'll begin with the missionary position. Um, <laughs> The missionary position is very easy to explain. Uh, it's what every linguistic graduate student working for the first time in an indigenous community <coughs> assumes. And that is, uh, God, I must say this language now. But of course, uh, it's not as easy as that. And it's not the job of non-indigenous scholars to save anybody's language. That's why I introduced the metaphor of the mechanic and the car. Okay, We don't drive these vehicles. It's up to communities. Um, to do what they will with their languages, including, by the way, letting them lapse, putting them uh, into, into storage, um, or deciding that they will uh, attain many levels of competence from essentially a kind of symbolic competence where you get up and speak one word of your language right through to complete fluency. That's their job. Our job is to make sure that um, we use the tools that we um, have acquired and can use as, as linguists um, to help as best we can in that position. So that's a missionary position. Okay? The next thing I'm going to, I've just coined a word, I'm quite pleased with it. Fothenticity. Fothenticity. False authenticity. Okay? There is a great tendency uh, in linguistics um, to canonize what um, uh, my colleague in anthropology, Shailene Muhlman, has called the last speaker. Um, to uh, assume that there's a mythical ideal of um, full uh, pre-colonial fluency in a language and fluency in a language being also fluency in a culture because they're very often they're grouped together. Um, uh, that I think is a mistaken notion because there's never been a uh, authentic speaker. A language grows and it grows under the circumstances under which um, the people who speak it exist. And in the case of First Nations languages, this is not very well known, but First Nations languages in BC were thriving, were in, in no danger whatsoever until 1946. Um, it is a, after the Second World War, um, fully 50, more than 50 years after residential schools had been thoroughly institutionalized in BC, that languages began to be, thank you very much, um, excuse me, uh, <laughs> began, um, began um, to disappear. And they disappeared not because of residential schools, actually, but because of government policy. And the government policy um, of um, assimilation after the Second World War was what if, if, if effectively marked um, the decline of First Nations languages. Um, so for uh, the 60 years previously, when everybody had been to residential school, um, the languages had absorbed and were uh, fully adapting to um, a life which, which um, w uh, um, was uh, a coexistence of a certain kind with white colonial communities, but also Chinese communities and um, other immigrant communities. So um, I think it's very dangerous to talk about some kind of authentic speaker, authentic culture, authentic pre-colonial culture. I don't think that ever existed. There's always been um, colonizers and, and colonized even within pre-white um, uh, North America. Okay, let me now be a little bit, I've got five minutes and I'm gonna do the really controversial ones just quickly so I can get them in. Okay, spurious relativism. Linguistics is linguistics. There is no indigenous linguistics as opposed to Western linguistics. A verb paradigm is a verb paradigm, whether it's uh, being used by me or by one of my indigenous colleagues. Um, I don't want to, uh, um, um, to deny the uh, importance of uh, cultural and moral perspectives on knowledge, but uh, uh, I am first of all servant of the truth and second of all servant of the uh, communities with which I work with. But if it comes uh, to a battle between the truth and the communities I work with, the truth wins. Okay. 
And finally, tokenism, okay? And so uh, tokenism is a bigger issue. It's a huge issue in this university. And um, I want to make one uh, very provocative suggestion, which is that um, everything we've been talking about so far has been on the level of um, the academic um, uh, position with respect to indigeneity. But this university is, um, is uh, actually more than, an, uh, more than an academy. It's also a giant real estate corporation. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, if you look at the board of governors of this university, uh, the board of governors of this university is not dominated by academics, it's dominated <coughs> by real estate agents, believe it or not. And um, so uh, why does this relate to indigen indigeneity and uh, I don't know more particularly? Because, because really what colonization and decolonization is about is not about language, it's not about academic positions, it's about power. And power and uh, indigenous people recognize this very, very um, simply. When um, uh, a First Nations chief in, uh, in this province gets up to speak, they speak about two things. They speak about language and land. Tmich in Kualutin in in Klaatlimkach. So here's my uh, modest suggestion: Why is there no representative of local First Nations on the board of governors of UBC who actually implement power in this university, as opposed to the academics who uh, are there to justify and question power, but perhaps don't address head-on the issues that we should be addressing in a straightforward fashion? That'll do. Thank you very much. I've been writing madly while our speakers were talking, and it made me think how I wish this morning I had sat more idly <laughs> with my tea and <laughs> let some of these ideas uh, resonate. So I have about four kinds of uh, thoughts that came to mind uh, as our speakers were um, discussing their work, Marjorie, Page, and Henry, and sharing us with an understanding of their work um, in areas of history and uh, English and linguistics. And so I'm also going to weave that in uh, with some of my own work, which is looking at Indigenous education within teacher education, um, as I know that was also raised this morning in, in some of our questions. So I guess the first thought that I had uh, really uh, you know, resonate with these talks was this emphasis on relationships and how critical uh, these rela you know, relationship building is to this uh, process of moving forward uh, in this society, in this world together. And so I think about some of the work that we're doing in this Indigenous education course, this newly required course in Indigenous teacher education. And you know, we lo as Joanne said, we did some consultation with practitioners in the field and, and certainly others, uh, but as well as looking at some of the scholarship and and so when I talk to the students about, you know, they come to the class and they're really just, how do I do this work? How do I do this? Tell me what to do. And I, you know, I really try and stop that kind of thinking to say, this is not just about learning how to do. So it's not, this isn't just about a methods course. That uh, this is a learning about being. This is, uh, you know, we need to learn to be in relation. So it's not about doing, it's, it's about being. We need to be in relationship and learn how to be in relationship. And so use that as a thread in which to weave across the course. And so this notion of relationships becomes really, uh, really critical. And there's certainly a growing body of research that looks at this idea of relationships. So I think about the work of uh, Indigenous scholar Susan Dion at the University, of, uh, sorry, at York University, uh, Dwayne Donald at uh, University of Alberta, and, and they emphasize this this idea of relationship. That as non-Indigenous teacher educators, they need to uh, understand their own histories, um, their own ancestries, in relationship to uh, colonization organization in relationship to indigenous peoples. And so I think this notion of relationship is really foundational, and I really saw evidence of that talk when, uh, you know, Paige talked about her relationship and that this uh, this developing relationship that kept changing and evolving uh, over time. And certainly, Marjorie, as she talked about how to take up her work uh, when she was talking about taking up her work as. Um, 
teaching uh, indigenous studies or indigenous uh, literatures as a non-indigenous <coughs> scholar. And certainly Henry, as he's uh, talking about working together with very different perspectives, uh, coming at it from a linguistic uh, perspective and then working with a, a community. And acknowledging, which I think is really critical, those important, uh, those very differing goals, but still a commonality or a foundation within that is this idea of relationships. Second, I, I think about how important uh, this work is to being informed by Indigenous perspectives, uh, Indigenous content, and Indigenous history. And that it, when we were developing the course, this Indigenous teacher, uh, the, sorry, our newly required course, that that was really the foundation of what we were trying to do in that course, that our readings were then, uh, you know, we drew on Indigenous scholars. We created resources that drew on uh, Indigenous perspectives. And it's not to say that, um, you, know, you know, we've marginalized the place of non-Indigenous scholars and their contribution to that, because I think that those works really help inform our non-Indigenous teacher camp candidates about how to do this work, um, the kinds of perspectives uh, that would help then inform their own, uh, their own teaching, and I think all their, their emerging identities. And so I really appreciated some of the comments here from our panel today about recognizing the contribution of Indigenous perspectives uh, and, and to the work that they're doing, and, and Paige, when she was saying, you know, uh, rethinking uh, her secondary sources uh, in, in her, uh, sorry, in, in her book and Margie, uh, you're speaking to the example of we needing to change the stories um, uh, that we tell. Uh, I guess a third, uh, third point that these talks then raise for me also is the, the recognition that, the, the, that this relationship and building this relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples and enlightening or informing um, you know, others to indigenous perspectives that form, you know, the basis of this idle no more movement is the fact that this is an ongoing process. And working in teacher education, you know, we, I, when speak, working with the students, I talk to them about, you know, some of you may not get this right away. Some of you, you know, it may you know, you may get it right away, you may get it at the end of the class, but some of you may take two or three years to have that, what I think of as that Oprah aha moment, where it comes, where this all comes together for them, and they, they can start to make sense of the various ideas that we've been talking about over the course, such as decolonization, reconciliation, uh, social location, and understanding their social positions. And so I really saw evidence of that in our talk today as um, Paige reflected on this being, uh, for her, um, you know, her, her understanding was deepened uh, over, over time. And, and Marjorie uh, referring to uh, the fact that she's decolonizing her discipline and, and there's still lots of work to do that, uh, it, you know, it will take her career. And also Henry's, uh, Henry's approach to helping us de, uh, demystify, I guess, some of the work um, that linguistics do in, in our communities. And so I, I think that while we, and please remember this, it was all just kind of put together while, <laughs> while everyone was talking, so I hope these ideas are, are uh, following some sort of logical, uh, logical um, progression here. I, I think that we really need to challenge our ideas um, about, uh, uh, challenge our ideas of teaching about or teaching to diversity, and that we really need to be thinking about teaching from diversity, teaching from the point of, or from the perspective of, of diversity, and that, that we really need allies, uh, allies in this work. And I really appreciated how our three speakers today um, really think carefully uh, about their own social locations uh, as they approach this work, uh, how they develop relationships uh, in, in a very respectful way, and that um, that we think about our own privilege. I mean, if, as academics, all of us, um, you know, we really come from very uh, privileged positions in which uh, we do this work uh, with uh, and for um, Indigenous peoples. And so um, I, I really, 
ask us to think about, um, and I know, uh, sorry, Hartej raised the issue of, you know, as allies, how do we do that work? But we really do need allies uh, to help us challenge and, and change our existing relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. So, uh, miigwech for the invitation to uh, reflect on your work and uh, the theme of the, the conference then today. <laughs>